Hey, and welcome to another episode of Casper on BI. Today, I'm very excited that we're talking to Jeffrey Wang. And Jeffrey is one of the engineers who builds DAX. Uh, he's been there for a very long time. Before I joined the team in 2010, he was already working on the DAX engine. Um, so we're going to talk about the path, the DAX past, present, future. Um, what are some design choices we made? Um, where did we go along the future? So what DAX 1.0, 2.0, what is, what, what is the coming in the future? Um, direct query, which he also has a, a, a lot, lot to do with, uh, composite models. And I also got a, a ton of questions from you uh, on Twitter to ask him. So we're going to ask a lot of them too. So with that, let's just go listen to Jeffrey. Let's go learn about the history of DAX. Let's go to the episode. Hi, Jeffrey. It's great to have you here on the, on the Casper on VI channel. Uh, I'm very excited to have you here. And as you've seen on Twitter, a lot of people are very excited to hear your story. Um, but for those who do not know who you are, can you do a little introduction? Sure. Thanks, Casper. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Wong. I'm a, a developer on the Power BI engine team. I've been on the same team for since 2004. It's been a long time. and uh, I've been uh, working on previously on the MDX uh, formula engine and, and later on the DAX engine and uh, since the start of Power BI. Yeah. So I actually remember when I came to the team in 2010, you were already there and I think you made a transition over from MDX to, to DAX already. Um, there's only a handful of people uh, on the team left that really understand MDX too, but let me, maybe let's start with an interesting question. Uh, MDX or DAX? Oh, absolutely DAX. And, uh, but the uh, MDX has its own strength and uh, for sure. And, uh, uh back then, uh, MD, we, we were doing really well with the MDX engine as well. Uh, but the uh, Tableau and uh, click tech, they, uh, uh, came to the scene. They were doing really well in the self service business. That's why we transitioned from MDX, uh, that's focused on primarily the enterprise, uh, the big corporation market and uh, onto the DAX that, uh, that can serve both the self-service BI and uh, the large enterprise uh, market as well. Uh, that makes sense. So, um, what, what was the main, I mean, you, you kind of described it, but the main intent for DAX was to make it easier to use. Of course, uh, we already have a lot of people saying DAX not easy either, but let's start with the, 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 what was the design intent? Um, uh, you said it right. Uh, the intent was to make a DAX easier. Uh, then I know people are some, many people are complaining DAX is hard. We can address that question later. Uh, I just want to talk about the, uh, uh, two major, uh, intentions when we, uh, get on the, the Power BI, uh, uh, the, the basically redesign of the product of the Power BI. As we said, we try to address the competitive pressure from the newcomers to the uh, to the scene, the, the Tableau and the Click Tech, and because they did really well in the self service business. Uh, what's the the major difference between MDX and DAX in terms of uh, simplicity? Is in that uh, M, in order to learn MDX, you first have to learn the multi dimensional model with its own set of uh, uh, like a concepts, so like a, a cubes, so dimensions. Uh, yes, <laughs> attribute relationships, attributes, members. So you have to learn a whole set of jargons before you can even begin to learn MDX. While in DAX, at the, even despite the other difficulty of DAX, at least the conceptually is just based on tables, columns, and the relationships between tables. You can't get simpler than that. And most people are just naturally, they get the, uh, the, the tables and the columns. So it, it comes naturally to the people. So in terms of uh, the conceptual model, DAX is substantially simpler than MDX that's based on the multidimensional model. And another, uh, there are other differences for sure. And uh, for us, we, uh, as uh, MDX developers for many years, uh, one of the frustrating things uh, is one performance. And the second is, uh, uh, 
how do I say it? Some people call it a fall off the cliff uh, problem. That basically means that you have a very similar expressions. You make a small change and the performance is just drastically different. It's just like, a, and, it, and it doesn't even make sense to the people. So uh, to address those performance issues, uh, there are many, many things we did in the DAX engine. Uh, and uh, one of the core thing is uh, during the MDX days, uh, we have this uh, uh, difference between cell by cell mode and the block mode. And the uh, MDX engine started off as a pure cell by cell mode execution engine. Later on, we added the block mode, but of course we cannot completely eliminate the cell by cell mode. So it turns out to be a mixture of both. And another major difference between MDX and the DAX uh, is uh, the, the reason I want to point this one out is in case you ask some other questions that's actually uh, people asking for some uh, features that are available in MDX but not in DAX. Uh, I just want to say that's intentional and uh, to address a particular issue in that uh, MDX engine has a stop and go execution mode. By that, I mean, we don't look at the entire MDX expression. We start executing and then after we execute a certain portion of the expression, based on the outcome of the execution, we decide whether to uh, further expand the rest of the subtree within the expression tree. So this stop and go approach has its pros and the cons. And uh, we deliberately stayed away from that stop and go. So from the DAX engine, not only is the block mode only, we also examine the entire expression. This allows us to do a lot of optimizations that is not possible in MDX. Yeah, makes so, sense. So those, those are the things I want to point out. That is that main so how long ago is it that you did anything in the MDX engine? Well, we, we still do something, but the, of course, the vast majority of the development are in uh, DAX engine now. When when did that happen? It's, uh, uh, at, at, uh, at least uh, maybe 10 years. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> it's yeah. been a while. <laughs> a long time ago. Actually, I did remember we did quite a lot of work in, uh, was it 2016, uh, with, uh, for, for uh, improving MDX on tabular models too. You never uh, yeah, we do. We have to, yes, we have to do DAX MD. We have to do, yeah, we, it's not like we abandoned the MDX engine. It's just like a, the vast majority of the new features come to the DAX engine. Yeah, it makes sense. And then, uh, okay, so I don't know if you ever listen to Rob Colley's podcasts. He talks about a lot of DAX too, because of obviously he was there in the beginning too. Um, but he's seen one of the things that I also kind of seen. DAX has gotten inadvertently probably like version numbers dax 1.0 which is where i'm at is the original og dax with no variables no iterators oh, and whenever i see something marco and alberto are doing these days or even when i steal our own code you know when i go go do the dax profiler and like steal the code that we're writing ourselves under the covers it looks completely alien to what we've started out with in 2010. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, yeah, it, it, it does. Because uh, the introduction of variable, by the way, many people uh, uh, complain that it's a bad name. <laughs> I try to call it a constant because uh, uh, it does not change unlike a, a true variables in programming language. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, uh, but somebody said, oh, in the future, we may actually allow the variable to be reassigned, but uh, uh, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, come back to this. Yes, variable does uh, fundamentally change the way people write the DAX. Originally, it was mostly functions and the nested function calls. Uh, you, so even with variables, people are still uh, struggling with uh, uh, the understanding the functional uh, nature of DAX. But, uh, uh, at least the variable make it uh, uh, much easier to look at your calculations in a step-by-step -step fashion. So yes, I, I also noticed that uh, the vast majority of the non-trivial calculations uh, uh, almost always contain variables in the expression. Yeah, yeah and, and it makes sense. And one of the other th things that he raised too is like, because we're only seeing these ways of writing these things and 
the bloggers and the people out there, they are getting more and more difficult problems that they can start solving. Tax becomes more complex because people only see this and not the simplicity of it. Does that ring a bell to you too, for you too? Uh, that is uh, true. Uh, maybe we can say, uh, but I, I don't want people to think that that's the only way to write DAX. Because uh, uh, going back to the root of DAX, we, we just talked about, we, try, we started off trying to address the self-service market. In the self-service market, you cannot expect anybody to become an expert overnight. Right? Yeah. But uh, uh, for many of the people who focus their energy on writing the white papers, the blog posts, and the YouTube video, all those ex uh, the, all those materials on the internet, uh, remember they are they also have to make money. Their customers are, tend to be the big corporations, which uh, which is where is the vast majority of the money is. And uh, so those corporations naturally have a bigger data and, uh, and uh, bigger tables and uh, more complex uh, uh, models, everything. While on the other hand, uh, on the other uh, end of the spectrum, there are lots and lots of self-service people who are just using uh, Power BI and the DAX to do uh, to solve simple problems. There's no need for you to write uh, the the, the perfect expression that working in any scenario that can work great uh, performance wise on large amount of data. If your data volume is, uh, is reasonably, reasonably small, if you, uh, if you don't need to over worry about the reusability of your model, then, uh, you can still, uh, learn the DAX in your own way gradually. It doesn't have to be a specific way. In the end, we, we definitely are not uh, moving away from the self-service uh, market. And uh, for the self-service market, we, different people take a different time to become, uh, in their own way, to become an expert in Power BI and the DAX. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, so maybe tying this back to like history and how things started, Maybe you can talk a little bit about like in the beginning, like you were talking about DAX, a functional language and things like this. How do, what was the rationale and the thinking around, okay, we're making it similar to Excel. Obviously it's not like Excel. What were some of the design thinking behind it back then? Uh, similar to Excel was a, a requirement back then. And uh, not only similar to Excel, back then the, uh, some people want us to be inside Excel eventually. Mm -hmm. So, uh, remember, uh, back then we don't have a Power BI desktop Power BI service as a standalone, uh, offering, uh, uh from Microsoft. It was a part, uh, Power Pivot. So Power Pivot, uh, at the beginning was, uh, add in to Excel. And there are some people think, oh, eventually we need to be, uh, merged directly inside Excel. Uh, in order to achieve that, uh, we have to be as compatible with uh, Excel as possible. For example, uh, uh, you, you still see the aftermath of that decision. For example, we have this separation between some and some X. They do identical things with just with different uh, syntax uh, signature. The reason why they have a different uh, syntax instead of, uh, can we just overload the sum just to do what the sum X does so people don't have to always learn two different versions and be confused by it. Uh, that was the decision back then that uh, we cannot uh, break the the the, uh, the sum of function when it takes more than one argument. Because in Excel, you can supply multiple cell references inside the sum function. That's when the sum goes from one argument to multiple arguments. So in DAX, we have two arguments. We have completely different meanings. The first one has to be a table. The second one has to be a scalar. That's a very different from Excel's sum way that takes two parameters. So it's for those kind of reasons, we introduce new functions just so we don't, if when, by the time we get merged into Excel, we don't break any of the existing Excel grammar rules. Of course, it never happened, but you still see the, 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 the well, aftermath I mean, of the application. Yeah. The Power Pivot engine still ships inside of Excel today. So. Well, yeah, well, when I say be a part of Excel, literally be a part of the Excel calculation yes. engine so that uh, the, the two languages become one, basically that was some people's intention back then. Yeah, I was there. It was tough to get that done. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, let, and then let's talk about like the phase two, because first we were power pivot and was mainly designed for like Excel users to, to 
Like I, I remember Donald Farmer demos saying, oh my God, we have 2 million rows of data. Amazing. And then Parview came and with it, also we needed to change our syntax, like to make it better performance. And this, that's where our variables really started to come, right? Yes. So we, we, yeah, we started so changing the language. Yeah. Yeah. We, we changed the, uh, the, the, so DAX is used for different purposes. One is as a calculation language, that part doesn't change much, but the other part of DAX is also used as a query language. So all the Power BI is generating DAX queries. So the first uh, uh, attempt of generating uh, the DAX query, or well, we were trying to make it uh, uh, close to a relational uh, database. So back then, uh, all the all the different functions we used to build up a DAX query was trying to be uh, uh, very, uh, have a one-to-one -one mapping to corresponding operators uh, in relational algebra. We're trying to be a very like a, a formal and uh, language that uh, can replicate a relational algebra. But uh, later on, we uh, found out the severe performance issues, especially in direct query. I don't know if you <laughs> if you still remember our first attempt at the direct query. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, even though we were able to push the entire query, uh, translated the entire query to SQL, the performance was just horrendous. horrendous. And uh, so we decided that that's not uh, uh, going to uh, serve the needs of the market. So we started uh, going back to our, our roots. We look at the MDX query, which does, which performs well when, when it does, when the, when the measures, everything are, are simple enough. And then we look at that, we uh, compare the, the nodes between the, the fundamental difference be, between the, uh, be, between the SQL approach and the MDX approach. So we adopted a mixture of both and uh, we started this uh, super DAX, uh, movement and the, the super DAX project, they introduced the variables and then we go and we move on from there. We fundamentally, uh, address the performance issue. And it's actually, uh, Microsoft got really lucky <laughs> in that sense, because when we started on the super DAX effort, we were still a Power, the power, the the intended uh, shipping releasing vehicle was a still power pivot, and uh, that has its own problem uh, independent of the query performance issue. Right there's uh, the release cycle and how to get the product into the hands of the customers. There were all many of the other uh, issues, but uh, uh, but then uh, after a rework, we started uh, okay Power BI become a standalone self-contained uh, product and service. And uh, that means uh, all the client team have to start from scratch. And uh, then uh, the reason why I said that, uh, uh, micro, so we got a lucky is uh, uh, when the new client get started, they have to start from scratch. And uh, so they have to basically rebuild everything. And, but the engine was already ready because we have been fine tuning the yeah. AS engine uh, all these years and building the super DAX, uh, new infrastructure, everything. So uh, the initial query uh, generation part was very primitive back then. And uh, I, I still remember that uh, if you have uh, like a five, like say if you add five charts on your report and if you do anything on the chart, like a re moving the window, moving one chart from a right, a, a one pixel to the left, or just a, do a, 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 a like a sorting, a, a resort a particular column. You do any UI gesture, it will resend uh, all queries on all reports to ASNG. So back then, the the uh, the part of the V1 of the Power BI UI was a stress tester of the DAX engine. But the, exactly because we uh, we already have the super DAX in place. It's a performance is not even too bad. Of course, people don't do overly complex things back then, but still when you have a, uh, any UI gesture will generate dozens of data queries to the back end that the, the engine can handle it. And people uh, don't uh, complain too much about performance. That's actually uh, uh, point out that our effort of optimizing the performance actually paid off really well. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, so uh, when you're designing, I mean, the DAX engine or the analysis engine, I mean, we've gone like almost like 20 years, no, almost like 15 years we've been working on it and it's evolved a lot over time. What is the hardest, like when you're designing a new DAX function or things like this, 
what is the what are all the things you have to think about because a lot of people don't really understand how hard it is and i, I keep telling people like it's not that easy to ship like features and things at microsoft what are all the things you have to think about uh for us, actually, choosing which function to ship is not that hard because uh, Power BI is not the first product on the market to do reporting and visualization, right? It's far from the first. Before Power BI, people have been using Excel, people have been using SQL, people have been using uh, uh, MDX, people have been doing these kind of things for decades uh, before the, uh, the advent of Power BI. So, for us, we just look at uh, how people have been building their pro uh, previous products, like what kind of functions they need, and uh, and then we we just pick the important and the more popular ones. So in that aspect, the, the picking which uh, new features are needed is not the hardest part. The hardest part is to make it happen. Uh, mm. To me, I think that the hardest part is always performance. Uh, Contrary to many people's belief, DAX has an extremely simple uh, conceptual model. It's actually, it's ex exactly because it's uh, so simple, many people don't believe it. Right? And, uh, but on the other hand, from our perspective, exactly because if you strictly follow the semantics of uh, each DAX uh, uh, function, the performance will not be acceptable other than for the smallest data volume and the simplest models. So for us, it's always about, we want to deliver these new capabilities. First of all, it has to work well with everything else. That's one of the strengths of DAX that we rarely do anything that is a dead end feature. Almost every single new function is composable with all the existing functions. So that's how people can do so many fun things together, right? It's like a, every function can pretty much call any other function at the same time. So there are very few functions there, there I, I wouldn't say there's none, but there are very few functions that uh, you can only do it in one way. It only solve one particular problem. You cannot do it using any other way. And uh, there are a couple for special purpose functions, but there are very few of those. But in order to achieve that full, full composability and also deliver good performance, uh, that requires a, a lot of hard thinking and hard design mm -hmm. and a, a ton of testing and uh, many iterations. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, to, yeah. I, so that kind of brings us to like in the latest demos mm -hmm. and sessions Jeroen and will jay have been showing new functions like offset and mentioned windowing mm -hmm. functions yeah it's really interesting to see like it really changes the mental model like when you can do offset in your dax expression like today you have to think about the model and you have to think okay i need to like in this date table i have to move my year to a previous year or like a running total and things like this, it's it's really hard. With this new offset function, I mean, there's so much more possible. Um, is this the start of DAX 3.0 where we can think about things a bit differently? And is well, it all syntax sugar? I wouldn't go that far. It's not syntax sugar. Window functions are uh, for people who uh, come from the SQL background. The SQL has uh, uh, window functions, right? So they have they, they they are using the over class. Even though the if you look at the SQL function, the window function of SQL, it was introduced 17 years after the initial uh, standard SQL standard. I believe the initial SQL standard was 86, and then I believe the it's, it's I remember it's a 17 years later. And they uh, introduced the window functions. This, and when I first learned the SQL window functions, I found that the syntax is really verbose. I don't know. I, I thought it's an advanced feature. But actually, I saw people just use it, uh, especially analysts. The people who are not supposed to even know SQL, they actually use the SQL window functions all the time. So that the uh, so, so how many years since the, the beginning of DAX? It's not a 17 years for sure, but uh, it's about time that we introduce uh, equivalent functionalities. Offset is the first one. There will be a few more coming uh, 
uh, to join the family of uh, uh, DAX window functions very quickly. And they are actually uh, really convenient uh, for uh, to do a certain type of uh, analytical work, especially uh, if you want to do uh, cross row uh, calculations. Right. So, so DAX was always is is easy to do if you stay on the same row. If you want to combine values from uh, different measures on the same row, but uh, every time you want to go across rows, it's a bit challenging. And the yeah. set of window functions yeah. will make it easier. And also, they 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 are actually much more performant than their uh, predecessor. Basically, the equivalent ways of doing things in DAX today is much less performant than the window functions. Yeah, so, okay, that's good. So we talked about it. So it's not syntax sugar. It's directly built into the formal engine as a native query. There are performance mm -hmm. uh, considerations. I mean, it, it, it helps improve. So, I mean, that kind of ties into some of the other things too, right? Because what one of the things that we want to do, I mean, we've been trying to do this for a long time, is less verbose, less queries being sent to formal engine or Dara query or things like this. Also, this will help in that regards too, right? Because yes, I, I yeah. And, and when you think about these things in in DAX in the traditional sense of the way, when you navigate to relationships, things get complicated. And yeah, here you can merge more queries into one. And that's right. Not a, not a specifically for the window functions. I wouldn't say that a cause uh, the. Uh, uh, less uh, queries to the storage engine. It's just doing things in a different way uh, to uh, to deliver performance. Primarily, actually, in the formula engine, and uh, then in the uh, storage engine. At first, we thought about also pushing it directly down to the storage engine. Then we realized that uh, it is not the common use case. Because the people most likely will do a storage engine query to do the aggregation, to do the group by before they need to do this, uh, uh, like a cross row calculations. And so most likely the cross row calculation need to happen after you have done the aggregation first. And actually, so this is one of the questions that happened on Twitter. People want more blog posts from you, Jeffrey. <laughs> they were asking, okay, can we get more blog posts from Jeffrey? This would be a really good topic. A nice deep dive uh, into offset, for example. Okay, maybe I should write one because, uh, first of all, the reason I've been writing less is uh, in my, when I was a manager, I was just like, I just simply don't have the time. And now I'm no longer a manager. Uh, maybe I do uh, have more time that I can do this. But uh, there's another reason I've been. Uh, 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 slacking off on writing more blog posts. Uh, when I first wrote it, Power BI was still very young, very new, very few, very few people know it. And so I want to get things, get, get it started. Now we have a really uh, 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 prosperous and uh, uh, like a very active community that there are many good people out there that are churning out good DAX materials. So uh, there's much less need for me to to yeah. enter enter that space to compete with all the other people who actually are much more dedicated and closer to the end users than I do. Uh, but uh, I do see uh, some misunderstanding of the function. I have seen some uh, blog posts that uh, seem to have a misunderstanding what this function does. So I'm, maybe I should write about it uh, just to uh, dispel some uh, misconception of what this function does. And also usually your blog posts go deeper than the average uh, thing, which a lot of people love and uh, have to, like I, when I read them, I have to read them like a couple of times to really okay. like, and, and I think a lot of people love that to be able to have that deep understanding of how things work under the covers. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'll try to strike a balance between like a, a easy to understand and also the, 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 the to, to expose the inner working of these functions. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the next very related topic, which also mm -hmm. you've been working on for quite some time, Dara Query. Yeah. Um, let, let's start with like, for those who, like in your words, how does Dara Query work? Um, that actually comes down to, uh, as I said, a misconception about how does a DAX work? 
So I, I saw a question and one of the question is, uh, how do I know if something goes to the storage engine, some sustain the formula engine, right? The amazing, there, there's actually a simple answer and a complex answer. The, the answer to this is both a simple and a complex at the same time. If, as I, I already mentioned once, DAX has an extremely simple mental model, exactly so that the users, self-service users, don't need to overthink. There's really no trick. Let me use the SOMAX as the example. Right? So for SOMAX, uh, many people uh, think that even that can be hard. Let me, let me give you an example why some people even think that can be hard. So if I'm, uh, uh, how about average X? Maybe that's, some X is the same, but average X it maybe is more uh, realistic. It's just like a, if I have a, a measure, that's a distinct count of customers. And then I want to calculate the, the average of this, uh, like a unique customer count over 12 month period. I'm gonna use average X, and then I'm going to do the, the, the selected months, the 12 months, and then I put the measure there, which is to get, give me the unique, the distinct count of customers, then uh, I will get that, right? So that's what average X does. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a very straightforward. You basically take a one, 12 months, one month at a time. For each month, you get the, uh, the number of distinct uh, customers, and then you get the 12 numbers, and then you do the average of them. So that's a people's mental model. It is exactly what it's supposed to do anyway. And even the SQL people are thinking, yeah, you cannot, uh, uh, you, you, if you want to write, uh, basically put that into a single SQL query, I could do a group by of the months and uh, then I can do a, a distinct count of the customers and then I can do a, uh, like a, use that as a sub query and then I can do a, uh, another calculation on the top in the outer query, right? In your SQL, I can, I, I can still push it down into a single query, but it's no longer a single simple select statement. It has to be, yeah. uh, have a sub select. But if I have a, but the thing about the DAX is the same mental model works for extremely complex models. Let's say I, I have another measure that's calculating the, the distinct count of uh, new customers in the current time period instead of just the unique customers. Then you have, you have to write some much more complex logic, right? But still, regardless of what the logic is, your mental model, when you try to do the average count of that measure, is still the same. You take uh, 12 months, one month at a time, and then you, uh, you, 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 you calculate that complex measure to give you the, the new customer in this time period, and then you, you, you just do, do, do the average. So from the end user's perspective who are writing the average X, the mental model doesn't change. And, but what if I'm just trying to do an average of a column? It's a, like a, in, a, in a real table. So for, if, if the mental model is still the same, by the way, it's still the same. You're just taking one row at a time, and then you take the value of that column you want to average. And then once you get all the values, we calculate the average. So so the mental model stays identical, regardless where you are averaging a single column, uh, a, a medium complex measure, like a distinct count, or a very complex measure that's a, a, a new customers in a time period. But for people come from the SQL background, they will be horrified. That, that cannot possibly be you know, the way you do an uh, average of a column, right? If you do it that way, that will take forever. You read all the rows of that table and then you take one matter at a time, you do the average. It cannot possibly be uh, that way. Yeah, of course, it is not that way. So, so, so what I'm trying to say is in DAX, if you really look at the semantics of the language, the only time you need to go to a table you need to uh, go to the storage engine is when you try to raw, read the raw data of the table. That's the only time. In theory, everything else is done in the formula engine. Yeah. But of course, if we actually do things that way, even simple things like an average of a column become too, super slow because instead of pushing the average down to SQL, right, we are have to read all the rows from the table and then do the average in the DAX engine. Of course, we're not going to be doing that way, even though the semantics doesn't mean that. So, uh, so the simple answer to, uh, to the question about what should go to the storage engine, what should stay in the formula engine is uh, at the most naive level, 
only the lowest level table scan to get the data need to go to the storage engine. Everything else is done by the formula engine in the DAX engine. But exactly because that cannot possibly uh, be performant, we have done an enormous amount of optimizations in the DAX engine to push as many operations as possible down to the storage engine. The, the story becomes even more complex given we have to deal with all kinds of uh, different storage engines. The capabilities of a VertiPack engine is uh, fundamentally different from uh, uh, relational databases. For example, VertiPack engine does not have uh, a sorting operations in there. It can, doesn't support any order back, for example, right? So, uh, so that's where the uh, why it's becoming more uh, difficult for people to just uh, like uh, naturally figure out uh, like uh, what operations can be pushed to the storage engine, what cannot. It's because it's not defined by the language itself. It's completely up to the optimizations we have done uh, in the in the in the DAX engine, and uh, simply because we have uh, done so many and it's an enormous number. For example, average of a single column will be pushed up to the uh, relational database. But uh, uh, average of uh, uh, distinct count uh, will we'll push the distinct count part down with the group by, but the average will be, will be done in the DAX engine, for example. And similarly for the the, the, the new custom average of new customers, uh, then we'll push as big, uh, um, as many operations as possible, but the the rest of them will be done in the in the DAX engine. So there is no so simple actually, rule by speaking at the expression. Uh, so that brings us, we'll come back to dark query in a second. This actually brings us to the next mm -hmm. DAX debugging. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. some people are asking like, okay, I just want to have a nice formula solver like we have in Excel to figure out what's going on and how things are going to kick. Because as you said, it's like, it's seemingly arbitrary. Obviously it's not because it has to do with what have you optimized an L services team and what haven't you optimized? So how can we figure this out? And does your new debugging function help in this too? It can help to some degree, uh, exactly because uh, we have uh, so many optimizations that uh, DAX is a declarative uh, language. So like a SQL is a declarative programming language, right? So for SQL, we will say table one, first, if, if you spell, if on your SQL statement, you say table one, first joins with table two, and then join with table three. The, act, the actual SQL server may decide it to table one joins with table three, and then joins with table two, depending on cardinality estimates. So, uh, so that's one example of a, a declarative uh, language that, uh, uh, it's not based on what you spell out. So the programming language is a, the, the, the compiler is just trying to, uh, give you the same result, but use completely different execution strategy. DAX has taken that approach to an extreme, right? We are doing all kinds of uh, different optimization. For example, one of the famous examples is the fusion, right? So you have uh, one sum X, you have another average X uh, somewhere else. And they are not even in the same uh, uh, same branch of things. They can be in different measures, but then we take a look at the overall query, and then we decided, oh, I can take this part and that part and that part. Uh, they are completely in different places and combine them together, send a single uh, uh, query down to the uh, to the SQL uh, uh, direct query data source. Right. So, uh, so, so exactly because of that, uh, by putting my new function. Uh, mm -hmm. that may disrupt that optimization because now you are doing additional things previously you don't need to do. So sometimes we have to turn off the optimizations. So if you want to use uh, the new function to, to, to figure out what kind of optimizations are there, uh, that may not be the best way to go. I, I would say that, that, that the purpose of that function is primarily for you to, de to debug a correctness problem. And to learn the, uh, like a, so what can you are explain the it real quickly? The, your, the, the new function, can you explain it real quickly? Yeah, we, we have this function called a uh, evaluate and log, uh, that uh, you can wrap it around any part of your DAX expression. It will not, uh, it will basically 
return exactly the same num uh, same result. It can be a number or it can be a string or it can be a, a table and ask that expression. So it does not change the outcome of your uh, expression, yet it will print that value into a special place. We call it the DAX debug output. I have uh, provide a free tool for people to visualize it until uh, we will have to wait until desktop or other uh, tools to uh, catch up and then to expose the same functionality. It, it, so the whole blog, idea is- Right? It's on your blog. Yes, yes, yes. I wrote I'll, I'll uh, several I'll put a link in the which, description. Yes. So the whole idea is that now you have this uh, called uh, the print debugging technique. You can later print uh, functions throughout your DAX code, and uh, then it will just print out the intermediate results uh, throughout your uh, more complex expression to give you an idea like uh, which part of uh, your uh, DAX is returning what. So for you to figure out the mostly correctness problem. Okay, so correctness, not performance. All right, makes sense. Some, so, sometimes, you, it's like a, a, a Chris Webb has a, a, a written a blog to use exactly that function to to do some performance investigation. That's a, that's a good one, uh, but uh, that's not a, you, you should not expect that that's the general purpose of that function. Yeah. All right, makes sense. And uh, I mean, I know you and I have been talking about this DAX debugging for, I don't know, forever. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard, yeah. especially to the po to the point you, you just mentioned, like I, even writing, I remember us talking about a query plan a long time ago, and we actually had a prototype of one at one point. It became super complex. Like I to, to your point, like actually pinpointing like a single, like because everything is nested and there are sums and there's averages and there's different measures and there's things. One single query plan gets super complicated. Are we ever thinking about like, I know we should not talk about ever, ever because like, yeah, we've been talking about these things for a long time, but do you think it's, do you think it's even feasible to create a tool that would actually help us like create a query plan for DAX, just like we have for SQL? Um, uh, as you said, never say never, uh, but before we get there, uh, the first, if I were to build a DAX debugger, the first thing I want to do is to expose uh, the evaluation context. To me, that is uh, mm -hmm. because it's yeah. hidden, even though uh, it's not hard to understand if you accept it. But uh, the, the, the primary difficulty is uh, when you write a complex expression, you are changing the evaluation context all the time and the, you, uh, and the part is invisible. So I think if uh, uh, I were to write the first part I'm going to add is uh, so that I can point into any portion of uh, your uh, expression and then uh, you have a way for you to see the evaluation context there. Then that will make your uh, debugging much, uh, much easier uh, to achieve. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, cool. So let's go back to Dara Query. Because you were explaining mm -hmm. how Dara Query, how does Dara Query work? So Dara Query uh, works. Okay, so let me put it uh, this way. Many people misunderstood the direct query because uh, they had come from other tools. Most other report tools that uh, do direct query is because they are visual. When you drag different fields, everything, they are visual is building a SQL query. Hmm. So, so for them, so when they drag a column, when they drag a me measure, when they drag a filter to their report, what they are building is a SQL query. So they thought, oh, this thing is, going to be what the, so if they happen to also understand how SQL works, they, they, they have uh, like a, a understanding, uh, a, a expectation about like what the query should be generating, right? So some, so that's actually mostly true when you, when you build, uh, uh, when you write a simple measures, that's actually mostly true. But just remember, it's not a DAX, it's the Power BI visual is not building a SQL query. They are building a DAX query. The fundamental difference between DAX and SQL is uh, that the DAX measures are reusable. This reusability means uh, I can define a, a calculation that can work in any context, not only in a particular visual. So with that in mind, you understand that uh, what we are, what we build is a DAX query that's a fun, that's, that's like a fundamentally, that's completely different from the SQL query. Therefore, the DAX engine will do its best to 
to push as uh, many uh, operations as possible down to the uh, to the relational database, but it's not the intention at all for the entire visual query to be uh, converted into a si single SQL query. Actually, we even tried that once. Uh, that's our first attempt of uh, building direct query. The performance actually is really, really bad. That's why even though we are sending multiple SQL queries uh, to sometimes, I didn't say all the time, sometimes when, you, when your calculation becomes complex enough, when your model becomes complex enough, uh, when we send uh, multiple queries to the uh, SQL, that's actually uh, much faster than we actually, if we were to fold the entire query into a single SQL complex, a single statement, because single, SQL optimizers is not designed to handle overly complex, uh, like a complex subquery drawings, all those kind of things. SQL, SQL query optimizers cannot handle that. They are very good at a certain type of structures and we are generating those structures. And it's also uh, because we have this powerful post-processing, the DAX engine can take a multiple SQL statement and stitch them together. So that makes some slightly more complex things that's hard to do in a single SQL query, for example, some people complain that a Malloy cannot even do like a, a single query that have a, a two fact tables simply because they have not the ability to do generate those queries yet. Uh, so, for, but for that, for DAX, it's very natural because it's for us like, okay, anything we cannot uh, send in a single single query, we can always send it two and then stitch them together. We have an extremely powerful engine. Well, the Malloy, you have, they don't have a separate calculation engine, so they have to push it like it down. Uh, everything has to be pushed to SQL. So, so for slightly more complex models, they can't even do that. So the, to answer your fundamental question, what is direct query? Again, we are our DAX, not the DAX, Power BI visuals are not building a SQL query. They are building a DAX query. And the DAX engine is doing its best to push uh, 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 the maximum amount of work down to the SQL uh, when it makes sense. So, and then just because some people say this, they think the DAX, we just look at the DAX query and then mm -hmm. translate it to SQL. But it's not really translating it directly to SQL, right? We are correct. Formula engine is. Like we're just swapping out VertiPack for a different engine, in this case, the SQL Server engine. And then we're trying to figure out, okay, this is what we need. And then they ge it generates SQL queries. That's correct. Yes. So the, 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 the identical uh, DAX, so even when we generate a single SQL query, the semantics of the DAX query is just completely different. So if I really go to the most basic part, if you look at, uh, the, let's say I drag a single column, a single visual and a single uh, uh, filter, if I just do that a simple thing, and it's a single sum of a column there, there's only a single table here, there's no complex model here. The naive DAX semantics is for each unique value of that group by column, calculate that sum, and then go to the next row, get the next value of the group by column, calculate that sum. So I could be sending hundreds of sums to SQL if, if we don't do the optimization, but that is actually the, 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 the visual semantics. Hmm. So it's, it's very different from SQL. Very, very different. Yeah. It makes sense. And you kind of touched upon something before, which is something we were incrementally shipping to like fusion. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that a bit more? I mean, we, we just they released a blog post on it, but can you talk a little bit more about it? Yeah. So why do we need Fusion? So far, DAX, uh, most people, they, uh, they deal with the DAX measures, right? So one of the things that people need to understand is uh, measures is the true innovation in this space. It's, it's the core value of DAX. Measures is reusable. There's no equivalent thing in Excel. There's no equivalent thing in SQL. They, they just don't have it yet. So and I know there are some Mallow is putting some effort and try to go that way, try to introduce, and they actually run into exactly the same problem, but I'll come back to here. So measures are fully reusable. That means it's not tied to any report. Even so, th so that means when you have a two measures, even if you add them to, to the report, semantically, they are independent of each other. So, the, uh, so we're supposed to naively evaluate one measure at a time. Because they are fully independent. That's how you achieve uh, uh, reusability. So in this report, it makes sense. I can add it to another report. It still have to make sense. For example, 
uh, okay, uh, I don't want to, uh, maybe we'll, we'll go to the more complex experimental, right? I don't want to get carried away. So come back to here. So again, when you add multiple measures, they are all independent of each other. So in order to achieve maximum performance, DAX engine have to do a deep analysis of each measure to say if it makes sense to combine them together into a single SQL query instead of sending multiple SQL queries one per measure. So the earliest, the first version of uh, uh, Fusion was to uh, combine basically uh, aggregations over different columns. As long as they're from the same table, they can be combined into a single SQL query, we will do it. By the way, so when I say SQL, I'm talking about the storage engine query in general, including vertical package. It's the same. Uh, and then uh, the, the most recent one called the horizontal fusion, even though people say that's a bad name, but regardless, it's a, now we can say, Marco, even if yeah, you are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even you are aggregating over a same column, but you have a, applied a different filters, we are able to combine the multiple filters into a, a, a into a single filter so that uh, we can uh, do a single aggregation of this column, uh, fetch more data, and then we can split the aggregation based on uh, like uh, the, each individual measure they are uh, asking for a, diff a different filter values, but all over the aggregation of the same column. So, so all of them is trying to combine uh, semantically independent measures uh, into a single storage engine query. That's the, what the that fusion is about. Mm -hmm. Great. So, okay. Next question, uh, also kind of related. A lot of people are complaining about the query is slow. We're having issues. What are some of the common problems that we, that you see? Uh, the biggest the problem with the direct query is slow. Well, uh, uh, let me name two. One is it's very easy in Power BI to create the complex models and the complex calculations. It's just a very, very easy to do. Uh, that's actually go back to our root of being a self-service BI. As a self-service BI tool, assuming the data volume is not that big, then you really can do anything you want. And the way, uh, so even though it's not the best performance, it typically is fast enough in modern day computers. Yeah. And we have a ton of optimizations that way so that you will not see the difference. Uh, from the human perspective, right? So direct people go to directory typically is because data volume is uh, too large. So, but the, the ease of use aspect of the product uh, uh, come into uh, become uh, like a, a hindrance to the to achieve good performance is again is uh, we make it super easy for you to build the complex models like you can do a non-star schema for example you can do a lot of by die uh, cross filtering you can uh, you can uh, you can easily write the complex uh, measures it's, it's just uh, very easy to do and uh, so that is one 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 of the reasons and another reason i noticed uh, that people always come into is uh, uh, a row level security because uh, almost everyone does a row level security after they have uh, spent months uh, building their model, testing their uh, queries, calculations without the row level security. And then they throw in row level security and suddenly the uh, performance is just fundamentally different. Uh, so uh, that's one thing that uh, I highly advise if you have a, a direct query model, if you are going to have a row level security, you want to start early. And because of that can actually change the query plan dramatically, depending on, depending on yeah. how you set it up, of course. So, so those are the things. Is there anything else I want to add about the, the direct query? Uh, yeah, yeah, let, let, yeah let, let's just stop here and, uh, and maybe I can remember more later on. Yeah, yeah, but I think, I mean, maybe to your point, like a lot of people may, might not even know, like whenever you create a rule of, a rule of security expression, it just gets on added on to every query. So it, of yes. course it takes an effect, but you, you don't know again, it's, it's, it's often an afterthought. So yeah, I, I, I totally and, agree and with also that. people confuse, often confuse a row level security filters with the user filters. And so some, sometimes they simulate a role level security using user filters. I say I have a, a set a country equals the United States as the role level security filter, right? And then they, before they define role level security, because they take more steps to do so, they will first try a user filter set a country equals United States. And the performance was good. But when they switch over to role level security, it's identical filter. 
for them, the performance is just different. It's, 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 that's by design. It's simply because as a security feature, we have to do a lot more than a user feature. We cannot do we 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 cannot do certain things that uh, uh, that we could at the user at the user level. So yeah. So again, it's so uh, testing, the, testing, the, testing. I mean, is, yeah, yeah. Do early, early, early testing. You want to introduce a role of security as early as possible in your development cycle. Makes sense. All right. So that takes us to the next kind of slightly related topic, which you've spent mm -hmm. a lot of time on too: composite models. Mm -hmm. So what's the main use case that we've designed composite models for? Well, uh, composite model, in, in my opinion, uh, uh, you should, uh, if you really want to get into a production system, you should stay with either small amount of data. Well, again, in Power BI, as long as your data volume is small enough, you can pretty much do anything you want and it just works. Right? And, uh, and of course we're, we're talking about uh, keeping everything imported you can combine multiple models. That's okay. But if you want to do large enterprise models, then, uh, it's uh, highly recommended that, that now you started with, uh, what we we don't even call it a composite model. We call it uh, internally, we call it a proxy model. That is you go to a same, same, you go to a single model, you just do customizations. That's, that's the, to me, that's the number one usage. You don't combine it with anything else. You just connect it to a one enterprise model. You do, you, sometimes you need to add a new calculated column. Sometimes you want to add uh, some, well, unfortunately, initially they're not gonna support calculated table and uh, due to some uh, security reasons, not because of functionality reasons, but uh, I, I can imagine you want to add uh, some calculated table. You want to add some new formatting. You want to add some measures you want to, so you want to build some user hierarchies. So you just customize the existing model. That's in my, is ideal situation. And the next uh, uh, way up is you can introduce some additional data, hopefully a small amount of data, especially when you try to drawing with uh, existing large tables. The cardinality of the drawing columns must be small enough for the drawing to be performant. Right? And uh, I have also seen people just, if you want to uh, like a combine multiple large models, that's mostly for the scenario of uh, a single dashboard. Some people want to build a dashboard in desktop instead of in the service. And when they, and they don't need a lot of a drawing between the models. They just want to show multiple charts together in a single place. So in that case, then yeah, the size of the model doesn't matter. As long as there's no drawing, then that's fine. Uh, so you can, so as a, so, so some of the typical use case would be, uh, number one is, uh, customization without any new data, just customization, just introduce a new calculate column, new hierarchy, new formatting, all those kind of customization of an existing model and, uh, and a small incremental, uh, addition and add of new data to a large model, a, a small amount of data to a, uh, to a large model. And, uh, and you can always do a uh, arbitrary combination of small models. That's typically, <laughs> it's not going to cause any problem as long as the data volume is small enough. And uh, one of my personal favorite favorite is my, I'm a developer is uh, it, it's not your final solution, but you have a model, you want to try something first, and then you can connect it to a model and then do your customization uh, locally. Uh, it can even enable team development, right? So sometimes you have a, a multiple person working on the same model and you don't want everybody to change the master model at the same time. And so you can have a single master model, you can have multiple people do their own uh, a, a development and then they can merge the result back into the master. So I can, I can, I can imagine some really, uh, uh, like a powerful use case of the competent model, but unfortunately many people want to do the, 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 the holy grail of PI. I can do arbitrary development independently. And then regardless of the size of the data, I just like I use a single competent model by pointing to multiple different, uh, separate, uh, models. Like uh, some people want to do one, uh, dimension table per model. So I can just combine like any number of dimension tables in the competent model, or I can create a, like a multiple really large uh, models and combine them together, have some really larger shared dimensions between them. So, so Unfortunately, we, we're not there. explain why that's so hard. Why, why it's, is that a problem? 
because we cannot, uh, in the end, the uh, competent model does not uh, uh, overcome a physics, right? So if you have a, a large amount of data in one physical location and a large amount of data in another physical location, if you need to cr uh, create a relationship between the two, and then your query need to join uh, the, the, the two sides together, we have to physically move enough data from one side to the other side in order for the drawing to happen. This this is the physics, right? So you cannot. Uh, 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 there's no magic. Just because uh, uh, Power BI makes it super easy for you to drag a line connecting the left side and the right side. Uh, the, uh, but when the actual <laughs> uh, data query comes, uh, the the data has to be moved around uh, and across physical locations. So that's just expensive. That makes sense. And then uh, so yeah, I mean you kind of already talked about it. The common problems is pretty easy. Like combining two large data sets and then uh -huh. data has to be moved around and uh -huh. you get into performance problems. Um, how long have we, have we been developing this? How, when did we start? Well, uh, well, well, that's a bad question. It's too long. You know, we have been <laughs> know, too long today, and uh, unfortunately it's still not uh, ready for uh, GA. Hope, hopefully soon, hopefully stay soon. But, uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's a longer than it should be. <laughs> and so why is it so hard? Uh, why is it so hard? Well, first of all, there are, there are, there are different reasons. There are, there are reasons in the service. There's a lot of security consequences of this, obviously, right? So mm. you, obviously when you combine different models from different workspaces and there are different security settings, everything, we'll have to worry about all those kind of issues. That's definitely one thing. It doesn't help that uh, we have uh, the separate, in the service, we have the separation between the shared and the premium. They were originally built from different technologies and uh, in order to uh, do uh, the combination across different services and then uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel and to do the service part of the work therefore uh, we, we want to wait for the migration from shared to premium to basically have a unified technology to minimize uh, the waste effort so that's on the service side on the engine side to me the biggest difference is exactly what everybody is complaining about the DAX they said oh this evaluation context is so hard it's complex it is hard and it is complex. And uh, what a uh, 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 competent model need to do. And uh, we have to replicate the evaluation context that because we are trying to say, I'm hitting a measure that's in the remote. So I have to send the, the query over, but I have to send its context over as well. So uh, the hard part is exactly trying to replicate the evaluation context in the local model to the remote model so that the remote measure can return uh, the correct result. Yeah. So, that, so that's the, yeah, yeah. So it's, that's the typical I mean, aspect of the engine development. The one thing that we definitely don't want to do is skimp on security. So that's definitely a good thing. <laughs> All right. Yes. So, so let's go to some of the questions that we got from Twitter. We already talked about some of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't think, as I mentioned on Twitter too, we're not going to talk about this feature and that feature and that feature. I mean, the possibilities are endless, but th there are some really good questions in here too. Um, and, and one question I really liked, what will DAX never do? And what are some conceptual limitations? Maybe something like cube functions or like in Excel, I we have string to remember. Well, uh... DAX will never become a SQL. So don't expect the, like a, the, the visual to generate a query that will be identical to SQL. So that's when many people who come in from the SQL background to learn Power BI, they were surprised by some of the, uh, the queries generated. DAX will never become a SQL. Uh, it's too late for us to do that. That's one. Mm -hmm. Number two is that DAX will never become MDX. And I want to go back to one of the differences between DAX. So many people are, so maybe we're going to touch on uh, more of this in the later questions. It's like a, this is stop and a go approach. It's like we, we had an intentional design to move away from it. We may come back to that to a very limited extent. But if you are complaining about the performance issue now, that stop and the go approach is the fundamental reason why it's impossible for us to optimize MDX to the same extent of optimizing DAX. So if you are thinking DAX is already too hard, 
if we go back to the MDX stop and go approach, then uh, but so we're what, gonna open a Pandora's box. Yeah. What what enables that stop and go that we in MDX that we don't have in DAX? In MDX, this, uh, basically, for example, you have a. Uh, uh, unary operators, you have a customer rollups, you have a cell uh, calculations, right? So what are those things? Those things are saying, uh, for, for example, unary operator, I, I, I believe one of the person on the Twitter asked for this feature. So I can say I have a bunch of, I have a dimension and in the dimension, depending on the member of the dimension, I can do a different aggregation, right? I can, so if I look at the basic, basically, if it's a profit, I do a plus, and if it's a, a net asset, I do some other uh, aggregations, right? It's basically yeah. custom total, right? So I'm thinking has that. So what does it imply? That implies that uh, I don't know what exactly the measure calculation is until I have acquired that dimension. That's, that's literally what I do, right? So, so yes, you, you can tell that in some cases, uh, uh, the, I, I, I can put a single slice uh, in the query that tells you that uh, oh, the, the account is, uh, let's say, asset. And then, yes, that's easy. That's the easy case, but not in the general case, right? So, so that's one thing. And another thing is that the MDX if statement is a strict if. It's different from the DAX if, okay? So by strict if is, uh, um, I need to evaluate the condition first before I even look at the branches. So that in terms of performance, it can be great for performance. So if I eliminate one, uh, one branch, then uh, no matter how big that uh, subtree is, I, I just don't spend uh, any time whatsoever on it. So that's the absolute benefit of it. But uh, if in the case, I still need to look at both branches, I cannot even do any optimization until I have already finished evaluating the condition. So, so, so actually this is a very useful feature. It can benefit the performance or it can kill the performance. It depends on what you want, okay? So, so those are some of the examples why MDX has this stop and go. And of course, uh, it also have the cell by cell mode and cell by cell mode is like, a, I'm not even going to the next sales calculation until I finish this sales calculation. So in those cases, we have not been able to move to block mode. Uh, and uh, so cell by cell mode is also another reason why we have uh, this uh, stop and go approach. We just have to evaluate one before I even look at the next one. So that kind of relates to like, is this also, I mean, it's not completely the same, obviously, but is that also why we introduced calculation groups to kind of do some of these yeah. things? Yeah. Yes, calculation group is our attempt at uh, doing something like that without uh, uh, repeating the entire like uh, execution uh, paradigm of step and go. So basically, calculation group is uh, we are doing it early, upfront. When the query comes in, we take a measure. We uh, we basically uh, use the different calculation items uh, to uh, modify the measure, but we do it upfront before we uh, started analyzing the full query. So we do it early. So it's, it's a little, it's a, a very limited version of that. And also at a different phase of the entire execution pipeline. Mm. And then someone on Twitter was asking about calculation groups. What has really happened when we do calculation groups? When is code replacement actually happening? Is it actually happening? Yeah, it is actually happening. So basically what we do is, uh, we take a query, we look at the, uh, the measure, and then for each measure, it becomes a nested if effectively. So it basically it's uh, if, uh, is this, uh, if, if this uh, uh, item, if uh, then we do this, we apply the other items calculation. If the other calculation item, then we apply the other calculation. And then we do some optimization to eliminate it on necessary branches of the if branches. So all of this happened before we started an analyzing the rest of the query. And then after we did this nested if rewrite, we started uh, uh, going to regular path of analyzing the full query and apply all the appropriate uh, uh, optimizations. Nice. This is another blog post study, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, oh, so, so this, people have not written about this? Said, okay, sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't think so. All right. So okay. another um question and this is actually one interesting too what has been the most challenging dax feature to develop uh i i can name a few uh well company model is one but uh and uh 
uh, Periscope, uh, basically the virtual column is one, but uh, I would say Fusion. Fusion is definitely one of the more challenging ones, simply because uh, uh, you have to, uh, it's a global optimization technique. You have to analyze the entire uh, query tree and uh, to, to look at all different uh, kind of uh, different places and trying to do your best to merge things together. Uh, that has a, a, a enormous uh, uh, amount of variables uh, that uh, enter into that equation. Therefore, it's, and, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a it's also very challenging in the sense that uh, uh, it's very bug prone. So it's very easy to uh, introduce bugs and uh, cause uh, unnecessary issues. And uh, so, yeah, Fusion is definitely one of the more challenging features. That makes sense. And now you've kind of touched upon mm -hmm. it, but like you said, like virtual cal columns, like uh, mm -hmm. virtual columns, actually. Um, so yes. where is that used today? I mean, we've seen it show up. It's used in the composite model because when you create a new calculated column, uh, the, the, by the way, the currently all the real calculated columns that they are materialized, they are processed during the, uh, the refreshing time, the refresh time. So uh, they are materialized once uh, the processing finished, uh, the, the, there's no difference between a real calculated column and uh, just a regular column. There's just identical from the uh, query execution perspective. But the virtual column is different simply because uh, you cannot materialize it. It's a, it's a, it's defined on a remote table, and uh, so it has to be sent at query time as expression over and uh, to the remote side in order to execute. Mm. So it's different. So it's, than, it's, yeah. so it's a bit different than what a lot of people have asked for is like dynamic calculated columns. It's actually uh, very closely related. Uh, so uh, the dynamic calculated column will use the identical technology, right? So fundamentally, it's an expression that's a uh, uh, not evaluated until query time. Mm. That, that, that's that's what it is, right? So so actually, exactly because we did that work for the comps in the model, when we introduce dynamic calculated column, it's much easier. It's a, it's a, we are sharing an enormous amount of infrastructure work between the two. Because they, uh, one is saved in the model, the other one is uh, saved in a different model and send at query time to this model. But, uh, but, uh, but the, the, the nature of the work is the same. You take an arbitrary expression, DAX expression, and then you have to be able to execute it uh, at query time. But I think, so this kind of comes back to, this is something you and I, we, we've worked together in the beginning a lot, like on these things. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that we have struggled with over the time is when you write a finish or write or finish a DAX function or formula, that's not the end of it. Then it hasn't shipped yes. because now there are so much impact of actually like, let's say you would finish dynamic calculated columns yourself. It still mm -hmm. wouldn't work in the product. Now we have to take developers off who are doing other work in Power BI desktop to be actually be able to, to finish that work. So yes. For a lot of people that is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's and, and, and to be able to get these things done. So I just wanted to point out that fact, like, okay, even if we potentially already have this thing already almost done, there's a tremendous amount of work on the other side that needs to be prioritized, uh, and other things have to be deprioritized, uh, to be able to actually get it into the product. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Actually, one of the reasons why Power BI is successful is uh, we have done as much as we can that if a feature can be fully uh, can uh, basically uh, uh, developed inside the engine. Uh, but uh, not uh, this one. This one, uh, the reason why is uh, as exactly as you said, uh, we, uh, the, the reason why there's an enormous amount of uh, uh, front end work that they need to make this thing work end to end is for two reasons. One is uh, uh, for dynamic column, the reason why you want to call it dynamic is you want that, that to be impacted by user filters. And the user filters are coming from the front end. So the front end have to tell the DAX engine that I want to apply this set of filters to this expression. So that's, a, that's the front end work. And another reason is Excel, because <laughs> how does Excel work? Right, we have a two front end, and uh, and the Excel cannot even be changed, unlike a uh, Power BI. Power BI, at least we can do the development work, and the Excel for the query generation does not even cannot even be changed. So yeah, so that's definitely uh, one of Tough the reasons questions. why, even though we seem to have the 
engine technology, but uh, for whatever reason, we cannot just release uh, the dynamic calculated column just yet. Yeah, makes sense. And then, so another question, which concept or functions had you wished we've added to DAX looking back? It's always easy to look back, obviously, but. Uh, you mean, uh, you mean new things I wish I had added? I mean, in hindsight, uh -huh. what are some things that we like a concept or a function we wished we would have added earlier on to make things easier? Of course, it's easy to. I see. I see. Oh, um, it's, it's, this question is coupled with another question, which is, uh, I wish I hadn't added. The reason we added that one is exactly because we 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 we, we couldn't add this one <laughs> back then. So this is related to something very very simple. Okay, that makes a DAX hard, and it's like a uh, there's a separation between row context and the filter context, right? So so this is one of the things that people always struggle, and uh, that's uh, one of the core reasons why DAX is hard is because uh, uh, this transition from when do you use a row context, when do you filter context, and uh, this, uh, so this is definitely something that uh, I wish we could have some, done something differently by making it a more, a, a more MDX like a context. And the re this is also one of the reasons we moved away, the, the, we try to move away from MDX. MDX only has a filter context. It does not have a row context. Okay. So at that time we were thinking, okay, we want to, uh, MDX there, like for some simple things are very hard to understand. For example, we have an iteration function to get a column value. Why is it so hard? And uh, also like a, a calculated column was, uh, uh, was not a thing for MDX. So yeah. we thought our oh, calculated column can solve a lot of problems, but uh, despite the, uh, yes, we did achieve all those goals. Calculated column becomes e e easy. Iteration function becomes easy to understand, but, uh, uh, we didn't anticipate that uh, people will quickly move into uh, filter context no matter what. We, we, at first, we thought people can build uh, enough basic solutions without even need uh, to, to truly understand the filter context, but we were wrong. <laughs> so people need to know filter context very early on. So now they need to learn both the row context and the filter context uh, at the very beginning, the learning curve of the DAX. That's uh, one of the reasons Mac and DAX But I think, hard. I mean, and we could have some, yeah. it was easy, like, in the beginning, I remember back in Power Pivot days, there was no Power Query. So you have to use calculated columns way more than you have to do today. So yes, yes. I mean, it was logical yes. to make that, uh, that choice. All right, cool. So mm -hmm. two questions that are also kind of related. Mm -hmm. If a new developer joins the team, how do you get them up to speed on DAX? Because it's, it's, it's daunting. Like you have to, he has to learn two things. This incredibly complex engine. Well, well, we'll take that out of out of the equation. I think for now, the second part is he has to learn DAX. And then the second question, which is related to this, what is the best approach to learn and become effective at DAX? Okay. Uh, the, to answer the first question is uh, there's no easy way because uh, uh, at first we tried all kinds of approaches and. Uh, after many years, I realized that uh, uh, the only way <laughs> uh, is uh, to teach them the right thing up front, and but still we have to that that person has to be truly interested in understanding this uh, low level system level programming and understand this unique concept, and so uh, that also comes to how do you learn DAX. So one of the most important thing to learn DAX is DAX is, has a innovative concept called a reusable calculations. There is no equivalent of things in SQL, in Excel, or in even any of the programming languages that as a professional software engineer, I have seen so many different programming languages. There's no equivalent concept and of this reusability. If anything does come uh, like a remotely close to this concept of a reusable expression, it's more like a, a named open-ended lambda expression that has unlimited number of free columns. 
so that this lambda expression can be reused anywhere and be able to bind to any variables in the in the environment. So, so this is why we introduced uh, the evaluation context. It's not because of some like a, some like a crazy nerdy architect that just wanted to uh, to to have this uh, like a abstract concept. No, it's it's a, it's a simply because we are supporting a reusable expression, and uh, so we just have to uh, uh, for all the beginners, they just need to need to accept that they need to learn a new concept. This concept itself, once you accept, is a new concept. It is so when people learn something, they want to. They prefer to draw on their past experience. They want to do incremental learning based on the principles they already acquired in the past. And this is a, one of the chances in their life that they need to learn a new concept that they don't have previously. Once they accept this, they understand this concept, that they accept that this like a, a expression that's a reusable anywhere. Once they accept this, then it become much easier to learn. It's just like when you learn calculus. I understand we have a, we can improve on the tooling. We definitely should, and improve on the documentation. We definitely should, and no, there's no doubt about it. But in the end, uh, I use a, let me use an inappropriate analogy. Like a calculus is hard, but the calculus is heavily documented. There are so many good materials and the YouTube videos, everything. But still, even if you are good at algebra. When you first approach calculus, it's just not a, something that you can just like pick up in the first day. It's it's because it introduced a new concepts and a new way of to, new solutions to problems that uh, you just take time to to get it. Yeah. That is one of those learning opportunities. We have introduced a concept that does not exist in your past experience. So once you understand that, you understand the need for it, you understand the technology to achieve that, then uh, the rest of them is actually not hard. Makes so sense. you have to get over this initial curve, initial curve. That makes sense. And then, I, I mean, kind of to point out too, like probably a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are not mm -hmm. the average Power BI user. It's the people who are thinking about like this very complex uh, returning customer problem or market basket analysis kind of a, like scenarios. And But the average, the average Power BI user never has to get here, you know, like yes. you don't really have to learn this stack. So I feel like sometimes we're a bit skewed when you go to conferences and things like this, there's so many people who are happy with it. Obviously it always can, as you said, we can always do better and we can always do, do, uh, do more. All right. So we are running out of time. So I have one last question that I ask everyone. What has been the most exciting feature of Power BI that is released in the last year? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be DAX or whatever. Uh, what is the most exciting feature uh, in the last year? I well, it's not a really. Uh, is it a release? I, I don't know. I, I believe this uh, web authoring mm. uh, has a great uh, bright future, and, and uh, but I, I don't know if I can call it a release yet because I know we're still working on it. But yeah, at least yeah, it's I mean, like for example, in data marts, where you can see a lot of uh -huh. these things already starting to show yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, totally I know right. it's not there yet. It's not there yet, but uh, I believe that uh, that can uh, can be a major breakthrough, and uh, in, in in the reach of Power BI into new market segments. All right, that makes sense. Well, Jeffrey, I mean, we're out of time. Thank you for spending almost like I think this is probably going to be the longest podcast. Uh, that I've done oh, so really? far. So it's really what good. I mean, we, we keep you, I'll, I'll probably get you back like in a year or something when new things have come, which we cannot talk about today. Um, but people have been asking about on Twitter and things like this. We're not going to talk about it, but we'll get you back and we'll talk more about it. So I really want to thank you for your time. Um, and again, keep on blogging. People have been asking for it. Uh, people are excited for you to do so. So that's really good. So again, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And that concludes another episode of Gas from BI. I hope you've all nicely geeked out on DAX and formula engines, storage engines. I'm definitely going to try to get Jeffrey back in some time from now to learn more about what he's been doing and what, what has been going on. I uh, really loved your questions on Twitter too, uh, for those of you who've been participating there. 
Um, if you want more, hit the subscribe button. Uh, we'll have many more interesting things. We're going to get Alberto on soon too, to talk about debugging DAX, some of the common problems that he's been seeing and many other things. So keep, stay tuned, hit the like button and I'll see you next time. Thank you.